Hello, I'm Sheldon Axler, the author of Linear Algebra Done Right. This video discusses part two of the section of the book titled Duality. The focus of this video is Annihilators and the Matrix of a Dual Map. If T is a linear map, then we would like to be able to describe the null space and the range of the dual map T prime. To do that, we need the concept of the annihilator of a subset of V. Thus, suppose U is a subset of our vector space V. The annihilator of U, denoted U with a superscript 0, is defined to be the set of linear functionals on V such that phi of U equals 0 for all vectors in U. We use the superscript 0 to remind us of the 0 that appears in the definition. Note that the annihilator of U is a subspace of the dual of V. Thus, the annihilator of U depends upon V as well as upon U. However, we do not put V in the notation because our choice of V will always be obvious from the context. Let's look at some examples. For our first example, the annihilator of the subspace consisting of just 0 is the whole vector space V prime. This is because for every phi in the dual of V, phi of 0 is equal to 0. Our next example states that the annihilator of the entire vector space V is just the linear functional 0. That's because the only linear functional that's 0 on all of V is the 0 linear functional. Let's look at a more complicated example now. For a vector space V, we'll use P of R, which is the vector space consisting of all polynomials with real coefficients. For a subspace U, let's take all polynomial multiples of x squared. Let phi be the linear functional on P of R, defined by phi of a polynomial P is the derivative at 0 of P. The claim is that phi, then, is the annihilator of U. Why is that? We have to show that if we take a polynomial in U, then we apply phi to it, we get 0. Well, that follows from the product rule. Think about phi of x applied to x squared times a polynomial. That's the derivative of x squared times a polynomial. And by the product rule, when we evaluate that at 0, we will get 0. Be sure you verify this example. The next result states that if U is a subset of V, then the annihilator of U is a subspace of the dual of V. This is very easy. Make sure you understand why it's true. Our next theorem gives us a way to compute the dimension of the annihilator of a subspace U. This theorem says that if V is finite dimensional and U is a subspace of V, then the dimension of U plus the dimension of the annihilator of U is equal to the dimension of V. We could solve that equation for the dimension of the annihilator of U, getting a formula for the dimension of the annihilator of U in terms of the dimension of V and the dimension of U. Please be sure to read the proof of this result in the book. Now we come to an interesting result that allows us to characterize the null space and the range of the dual of a linear map in terms of annihilators. Here's what the result says. Suppose V and W are finite dimensional vector spaces, and T is a linear map from V to W. Then the null space of the dual of T is equal to the annihilator of the range of T. And the range of the dual of T is equal to the annihilator of the null space of T. You can find the proof of this result in the book. Now let's turn to another interesting and very useful result. Again, the setting is that V and W are finite dimensional vector spaces, and T is a linear map from V to W. The result says that T is surjective if and only if the dual map T prime is injective. Furthermore, T is injective if and only if the dual map T prime is surjective. Let's talk through the proof of part of this result. Suppose that T is surjective. That means that the range of T is all of W. That means that the annihilator of the range of T is just 0. From the theorem above, first bullet point, the range of T having 0 as its annihilator says that the null space of T prime is 0. 
That means the T prime is injective. In other words, we have proved that if T is surjective, then T prime is injective. The proof of the other parts of the Slash theorem are quite similar. Please be sure to read the details in the book. To see why this theorem is useful, suppose you want to show that the linear map T is surjective. This means that you have to show the equation t of x equals y has a solution, x, for each choice of y in w. That might be hard to do. Instead, by the first bullet point in this last theorem, you could show that t prime is injective. That means you have to look at the equation t prime of phi equals 0 and show that phi equals 0 is the only solution. Often that's easier than proving that something is injective. We can now prove that if v and w are finite dimensional and t is a linear map from v to w, then the dimension of the range of the dual of t is equal to the dimension of the range of t. Let's look at the proof. We know that the dimension of the range of t prime is the dimension of w prime minus the dimension of the null space of t prime by the fundamental theorem of linear maps as applied to the linear map t prime which maps w prime into v prime. Now, we've previously proved that the dimension of the dual of w is equal to the dimension of w, and we also know that the null space of the dual of t is the annihilator of the range of t. That gives us our second equation here. Finally, we get this last equation by using our formula for the dimension of the annihilator of a subspace. Recall that the range of t is a subspace of w, and thus this is the correct formula, completing the proof that the dimension of the range of t prime equals the dimension of the range of t. We define the transpose of a matrix to be the matrix obtained by interchanging the rows and the columns. Let's look at an example. Suppose A is the matrix shown here. Notice this matrix has three rows and two columns. It's a three by two matrix. We interchange the rows and the columns. So what was the first column of A, that's five, three, negative four, becomes the first row of A transpose, five, three, negative four again. And what was the second column of A, negative seven, eight, two, becomes the second row of A transpose, again, negative seven, eight, two. So A is a three by two matrix, but a transpose is a two by three matrix with two rows and three columns. Our next result is fairly easy to prove. It says that if we have two matrices A and C, so that it makes sense to multiply them together, then the transpose of the product, in other words, the transpose of A times C, is equal to C transpose times A transpose. Notice how the order changes in between C and A, just as happened with dual maps. Now we can discuss the relationship between the matrix of T and the matrix of the dual map of T. Suppose V and W are finite dimensional vector spaces and T is a linear map from V to W. This theorem states that the matrix of T prime is equal to the transpose of the matrix of T. Some explanation is needed here because the matrix of a linear map is computed with respect to some bases and no bases are in sight here. What's intended here is that we have a basis of V and a basis of W, and that the matrix of T, which appears on the right side of the equation above, is computed with, that res with respect to that basis of V and that basis of W. The basis of W leads to the dual basis for W prime, the dual space, and the basis of V leads to the dual basis for V prime. Thus, on the left side, when we compute the matrix of T prime, we must use those dual bases in order to make this result true. That is what is intended by this equation. Again, this result means pick a basis of V, pick a basis of W, then use the dual basis of W and the dual basis of V to compute the matrix of T prime. Please be sure to read the proof of this result in the book. Recall that we can think of each row of an m by n matrix as a 1 by n matrix, and we can think of each column of an m by n matrix 
as an m by 1 matrix. With that in mind, we define the row rank of A to be the dimension of the span of the rows of A, and the column rank of A to be the dimension of the span of the columns of A. Let's look at an example to help understand the meaning of this definition. Suppose A is the matrix shown here. This is a matrix with two rows and four columns, so it is a 2 by 4 matrix. The row rank of A is the dimension of the span of the two rows. Those two rows are shown here. They're both 1 by 4 matrices. If we wish, we could think of these as elements of F4 using the obvious isomorphism. But what is the dimension of the span of these two rows? Well, when we have just two vectors, we can determine whether or not they're linearly independent by seeing whether one of them is a scalar multiple of the other. In this case, that clearly does not hold. Thus, these two rows are linearly independent, and hence the row rank of A is 2. Now let's think about the column rank of A. That's the dimension of the span of the four columns. We could think of this as taking place in R2, if we wish, by using the obvious isomorphism. What's the dimension of that span? Well, the first two vectors in that list are linearly independent, because neither is a multiple of the other. And we're working in a two-dimensional vector space here, so the span cannot have dimension more than two. Thus, the, the span has dimension two, which means the column rank of A is two. Let's highlight our two conclusions, both in red. The row rank of A is two. The column rank of A turned out to be two. Those two numbers turned out to be the same. We will soon see that this is not a coincidence. To prove our result about row rank and column rank, we will need the following theorem. Suppose V and W are finite dimensional vector spaces, and T is a linear map from V to W. Then the dimension of the range of T is equal to the column rank of the matrix of T. Notice that no bases are specified here. Thus, this result is true regardless of which bases are used for V and W. To see why this result is true, just think about the definition of the matrix of T. We have a basis V1 up to Vn of V. The jth column of the matrix of T is determined by looking at T of Vj, that's T applied to the jth basis vector of V, writing that as a linear combination of our basis vectors W1 up to Wm of W, and then writing those coefficients as the jth column. Because V1 up to Vn is a basis of V, the vectors T of V1 up to T of Vn span the range of T. The basis of W essentially sets up an isomorphism between W and Fm. That essentially allows us to think of the columns of the matrix as T of V1 up to T of Vn. The span of those columns, by definition, is the column rank of T, which under this isomorphism is just equal to the range of T. This is worth thinking about for a few minutes. Now we can prove the theorem that I hinted at earlier. This theorem says that if A is an m by n matrix, then the row rank of A equals the column rank of A. Let's see how we can prove this result. Use the matrix A to define a linear map T from the vector space of n by 1 matrices to the vector space of m by 1 matrices by T of x is equal to Ax. The Ax, of course, means the usual matrix multiplication. We can practically identify T with A. At any rate, the matrix of T is equal to the matrix A with respect to the standard bases. Now, the column rank of A is equal to the column rank of the matrix of T because A is equal to the matrix of T. This is equal to the dimension of the range of T by the theorem that we just finished proving, that the dimension of the range of a linear map is the column rank of the corresponding matrix. We also proved earlier that the dimension of the range of the dual of T is the same as the dimension of the range of T, giving us this third equation. Now, 
we use the result again that the column rank is equal to the dimension of the range, but this time apply it to t prime, getting our fourth equation. We saw earlier that the matrix of t prime is the transpose of the matrix of t, in other words, the transpose of a. Thus, we have the fifth equation here. Finally, simply notice that the columns of A are the rows of A transpose. Thus, the column rank of A transpose is equal to the row rank of A. This completes our proof. We have shown that the column rank of A equals the row rank of A. This concludes part two of the video on duality.